Time now for our weekly partnership segment with our friends over at The Lever. And joining us this week is the man himself, David Sirota. Great to see you, David. Good to see you, too. Um, so you have a look this week at the uh, so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which was signed into law by Joe Biden this week. And um, let's go ahead and put your tear sheet up on the screen here. You're focused in particular on some of the major blatant Wall Street giveaways that ended up in the final package. You say the Wall Street vote that screamed the quiet part out loud. Senators gave their Wall Street donors another gift after blocking the expanded child tax credit. Before we dig into the specifics of Ms. Cinema and her allies here, though, I would love for you, David, because we haven't heard your view on the show yet, just to give your overall view of this package and, you know, the end result and whether it was worth voting for uh, in your estimation. I think it's hard to know whether this bill will do more uh, good than harm. Uh, I think if you force me to to answer whether it does, I guess there's a decent chance that this bill marginally improves the climate situation, marginally reduces emissions. It was sold as a bill to reduce 40% of, of, of emissions. That, that was, that's not actually what it does. It adds, at best, another 10% of emissions reductions. The current policy gets about 30% of emissions reductions, according to the same estimates. So a marginal reduction in uh, emissions if everything goes right. And that's that's the big if. When making a climate bill, uh, attaching to a climate bill, a vast expansion of fossil fuel development, uh, you are inherently creating a gamble on the climate. You are putting good investments into renewable energy, but then tying those investments effectively to a potential expansion of oil and gas leasing uh, in, in the future. And so you set up, that's a huge roll of the dice. Yes, maybe the renewable energy uh, stuff takes uh, and outpaces. Uh, the fossil fuel development, that's a win for the climate. An alternate scenario is the renewable energy stuff doesn't take, the oil and gas industry uh, exploits the new leases, the expansion of leases uh, in this bill, uh, and that's not a win for the climate. So I think what happened here was the Democratic Party decided to cut a big giant check to every part of the energy economy uh, because they didn't want to make a choice. They didn't want to uh, create an enemy out of the oil industry. This is why the oil industry uh, celebrated the passage of the bill. Uh, and that was their political formula. But science is telling us we need to stop all fossil fuel, all new fossil fuel development if we have a chance to really deal with the climate stuff, uh, the climate crisis. So to my mind, again, a big gamble. Now, on the other side of this, these the sort of social policy side of this, I think there was great investments in IRS enforcement that were long overdue. I think they unfortunately uh, very seriously watered down the Medicare prescription drug uh, pricing stuff. There's still a couple of good things in there, but they seriously watered it down. And yeah. then they included some real tax giveaways uh, to Wall Street in this bill. Well, and that's a, that's a great transition because you can see the uh, fingerprints of corporate America on every single piece of this legislation. I agree with you on balance. I think it was better than doing nothing. I think it's a, a marginal benefit. And so, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say otherwise, but you see it certainly in the approach to climate. You see it in the approach to healthcare, which ends up getting watered down. And then you see it in these tax provisions. So let's talk about that piece because this was extremely blatant and you picked up on a real asymmetry here. So when Senator Sanders was saying, hey guys, all 50 of you claim to be in support of a child tax credit. Why don't we add that to the bill? It was, he was voted down. I think this is one of the ones where he was voted down 99 to one um, on something that they allegedly all care about. And the argument from Senator Sherrod Brown, supposedly a progressive and others was, Bernie, we have to stay unified. This will, for some reason, tank the bill so we can't vote with you on these things. However, when it came to Kirsten Cinema and her being like, no, we can't close the carried interest loophole, and actually I want these other uh, giveaways for Wall Street put into the bill, then they were willing to get on board and go along with that. Break down how all of that went down for us, David. Sure. So the Democratic leadership, as you said, enforced party unity against Bernie Sanders' series of amendments uh, that were designed to add back into the bill Democratic Party priorities. Uh, one of the big ones was the expanded child tax credit. He put a bill, uh, an amendment on the floor. The Democratic leadership, the Democratic uh, uh, senators joined with the Republicans to vote that down. And as you said, the Democratic leadership said, we have to preserve the integrity of this 
fragile deal. This legislation represents a very fragile deal. And even though we may supposedly want to do the, this good thing, expand the child tax, reinstate the expanded child tax credit, we can't do that because we have to preserve this fragile balance. They voted that down. And then a few hours later, they joined with uh, cinema and Republicans to add into the bill, and I, and I should mention, it wasn't all the Democrats, it was seven Democrats, so party unity not enforced, seven Democrats joined with the Republicans to add into the bill a $35 billion tax break for the private equity industry. It basically said that the private equity industry uh, in facing the new corporate minimum tax doesn't have to effectively tally uh, the revenues of its portfolio companies uh, in in deciding or in 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 terms of whether it qualifies uh, and faces that tax. So basically, it shields. It creates a special carve out for the private equity industry that has dumped a quarter of a billion dollars of campaign contributions into the federal political process in the last two election cycles. So a blatant and naked giveaway to the donor class hours after the same Senate voted down an expansion of the wildly popular child tax credit. And uh, Kirsten Sinema obviously sort of led the charge on this. I mean, how much money has she personally gotten from private equity? I know oftentimes the media likes to paint her and Joe Manchin as like acting in their state's best interest, and that's what they really care about. <laughs> Arizona not known as like a hotbed of private <laughs> equity activity here. So she's just I, I, I rarely do you see such a blatant quid pro quo, even though they're there all the time, as was on uh, evidence here. Larry Summers even was like, wow, this is gross even by my standards. Yes. I mean, look, Cinema, the Associated Press reported about a million dollars of campaign contributions from the private equity industry flowed into her campaign in the lead up to this, into, into the lead up of this, of the negotiations over this bill. Uh, Cinema obviously working for her private equity donors. There's just really no pretense here. By the way, there's no pretense with Joe Manchin, either the top recipient of uh, oil and gas money, uh, adding in the oil and gas giveaways in this bill. I mean, one thing we can say is we are living in an era where the, the corrupt folks in Washington have stopped really trying to pretend like they're yeah. not corrupt, right? I mean, it's just out in the open. And, and in some ways, that makes it easier to report on. It's easier to see. But I think what, it, what it's kind of an admission of is that corruption is now so normalized, so accepted, so part of the process out in the open that these legislators don't even feel a deterrent in terms of, of, of the optics of it. They are yeah. just doing the bidding of their donors. There's no other way to put it. It's it's literally shameless. Like they literally can't be shamed. Have no shame. On it. They, they, they don't cannot be shamed. Do not care. The thing that you know to me, I mean, listen, I, I'm I guess encouraged that something got through, right? And I think all the histrionics are historic and it's landmark and whatever is obviously dramatically overstated. But it was encouraging that something happened. However. On the other hand, I look at it, and because it is so clear how it was curtailed at every turn and watered down at every turn by corporate America, it also really demonstrates how constrained our political system is as long as big money is so dominant. Like, you may want Medicare to negotiate on prescription drug prices, but they're like, yeah, well, maybe we'll give you a few, you know, a few drugs, maybe a few years down the road. You may want Medicare for all, but they're like, mm, how about we just keep some little bit of extra Affordable Care Act subsidies okay. in here? It's all what corporate America is willing to tolerate to, you know, all the way to the point of the oil and gas companies were actually, they were cool with this bill. They were celebrating it. So what does it say um, at a larger scale about what are, is possible in our politics with our current political system. You are touching on such an important point here, which is that I think this bill is another example of the political paradigm of the best that you can hope for in our current politics are policies that do not make a choice. Now, the, the good side mm. of that, the best side of that is you can get good things funded right? You can get investments, for instance, in renewable energy, things that do not have a natural opposition. You can get those things funded. But the cost of getting those things funded is to uh, give giveaways to the industries creating the problem. So this bill did not have an organized opposition because the oil industry got huge gifts in this bill. 
Now, you can say that that's a good short-term politics, but I would argue if the oil and gas companies are happy about a bill, then it is not a bill that is seriously taking on uh, the climate crisis. I would argue to you that if the health insurance companies are happy about a health care bill, then you are not fundamentally taking on the problem in the health care uh, economy. And, and on and on the list goes. So I guess the point is, is that we are in a situation where neither party is willing to make any kind of choice that asks the powerful economic actors creating problems to sacrifice anything at all. And you cannot fundamentally and systemically ch solve those problems yeah. unless you challenge the interests creating those problems. I think that is very well said and very important point for people to reflect on um, as this week comes to a close. David Sorto, great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank you guys for watching. We'll have more for you later. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.